Russians are crazier than you think they are. But it's worse because their governments are much crazier than them. And so to understand what Russians are thinking and even more difficult task to understand what their government is doing, we've got to make a jump which takes effort. It's an application of willpower and a willingness to be patient before we understand. Have we done that? No. What have we done instead? We've paid Russia a kind of ethnocentric compliment. An ethnocentric compliment is when a culture looks very much like you superficially, and so you assume it is like you. But in fact, you can sometimes be wrong. So let's take an example. There are thousands of articles being written every day about what the Russian regime is up to by people who know next to nothing about it. They don't speak the language. They couldn't name more than six people in Putin's inner circle. They couldn't name even two of the top five or seven leading experts on the internal dynamics of the Kremlin. And if they knew as little about China as they know about Russia, they wouldn't write these articles. They'd just say, well, that's an authoritarian regime that's alien to me. And I don't know. But when it comes to Russia, oh yeah, they kind of look like us, so we must understand them. But actually, we don't. You and I are speaking now, and Russia is assaulting Ukraine with a multi-pronged invasion. We're going to put what they're doing in a big picture context. What's very important is that as I record this, you haven't seen the worst of it yet, because what Russia is doing is in two stages. The first stage is what Putin calls demilitarization of Ukraine. They're trying to take out Ukraine's military and disable it. But the second stage, which is more disturbing, is what they call denazification, which basically means anything up to and including just getting rid of Ukraine's government. It may include captures and assassinations of political actors in the Ukraine. That's going to come next if the Russians get away with doing it. And that's going to be the more disturbing bit of the story we haven't got to yet. Before we analyze this craziness to give you a picture of what's really going on, let's ask, where are the Russian people in this? I think there are three words you've got to put on the table to understand where the Russian people are. One is fear, two is trauma, and three is passivity or a kind of preemptive obedience. Let's look at them one at a time. First, trauma. Different countries, just like individuals, have different degrees of kind of collective psychopathology, different degrees of trauma. Some countries are more screwed up than others. If you think that each country is equally screwed up, you have absolutely no idea about just how much historical inheritance actually structures the psyche of a nation. Russia is traumatized by the horrors of the Soviet experiment. Ukraine is too. But interestingly, if we compare the traumas of Russia and Ukraine, Russia is more traumatized. And you can think of it like this. Imagine that in 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, Ukraine didn't go to therapy to process its trauma, just sort of plodded along. But Russia went to an evil therapist who went far in making its distorted sense of its own past much more screwed up and distorted. Second word is fear. And the fear that Russian citizens feel is not the fear that folks felt under the Stalin regime. There is no mass repression in Russia. Russian government represses its citizens pointillistically. So if you went to a protest today in Moscow against the assault on Ukraine, then probably nothing would happen to you. You'd be in a group, a number of people would be arrested, but the majority would be sort of chased away and nothing would happen to you. But there would be a risk that something permanent happens that damages your life chances. You might have problems at work, you might have problems with your education. So you are taking that risk and that fear is legitimate. The third word is obedience. And Russians have a tendency to obey and comply preemptively. But what about the people running Russia? What the hell makes them tick? And what makes Putin tick? Well, viewers of this channel know we've just had a very long conversation about the nature of the Russian regime. It's a kind of informational autocracy. That's to say it 
cares even more about the shape of the message than it does about the content of the message. It wants to make its citizens sort of get lost in the informational environment. And that's what they're relying on to conduct this assault into Ukraine because they've conducted no marches or parties to celebrate what they're doing. And in fact, they've tried to not show on federal channels in Russia that they're bombing the entirety of the Ukraine. This is something that they don't want Russians to think about. But what's Putin after here? He's basically after two things. He's after staying in power and a sense of mission. Staying in power for Putin means that there is no way for him to leave. There is no safe procedure to leave which guarantees him financial security, security from death and security from imprisonment. So he's sort of stuck and the dynamics around him are already so fraught, already so complex that every time he rocks the boat he knows he is risking that things will fly up and land in a different constellation and suddenly leave him with even less power than he had before. And one of the things that Putin feels he can achieve with this extraordinary misadventure is to create, at least for a while longer, a certain kind of unity in the people immediately around him. But then Putin has this sense of mission. How does that work? Putin wants to be positively mentioned in a three-sentence encyclopedia discussion of what happened with Russian foreign policy in the 21st century. And that encyclopedia entry might be written, let's say, in 2300. And what that does is make him think in very, 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 very big brushstrokes and very much in the long term. So when Scholz tells Putin, NATO is not going to absorb Ukraine, and if an if it ever does, it's not going to be on our watch. And Putin says, what are you talking about? I am interested in what it's going to say about me. What happened in the 21st century? Putin was a president who made Russia bigger, recreated the Russian empire at least a little bit by taking in bits of Ukraine or all of the Ukraine, and that's it. But we might say, well, hang on. The suffering of the Russian people is going to be so great as a result of this intervention. It's going to be worse, arguably, than the suffering of the Ukrainian people over the next quarter century as a result of this. And Putin's answer? That's a quarter century. I don't care. Give me 50 years. I don't care. Once the 50 years passes, nobody's going to remember these damn sanctions, but the territorial acquisition, me, 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 as the gatherer of lands, me, as the person whose individual will is entwined with the collective destiny of the Russian people and the Russian world, well, that's still going to be there, and that's what I'm after. And all of your stuff about the bad effects of the sanctions, 50 years, gone. It'll be absorbed by history. Is there any chance that Putin is right about this? No, there is no chance. Let's go back to 1968 and Prague. Now, in 1999, the Czech Republic was running away from Russia and joining NATO. And when it was doing that, psychologically, 68 was still present. And what happened in 68? The tanks rolled in. But it was nothing like what's happening now. Now Russia is assaulting Ukraine. It's attacking military targets, but we're seeing civilian casualties. And then we're going to have the escalation of the campaign onto this stage of denazification that we talked about before, and then maybe onto some other stages. And so this is way worse than Prague 68. Way, way worse. We're talking about extraordinary destruction of life, destruction of livelihood and violence. This stuff is going to be seared into the souls of Ukrainians for not just decades, but probably over a century. So Putin's long historical reach is totally gone out of the window. He's going to be remembered as a guy who didn't just do something criminal. He did something that was so criminal as to be a vast, large writ historical mistake 
that cost not just Ukraine so much, but cost arguably in the long run even more for Russia. What is he going to try next after he has done whatever he has done in Ukraine? He is going to use increasingly nuclear war as a way of conducting quote-unquote diplomacy. Now notice what he said before he went into Ukraine. He said, if anybody interferes with what we're doing, you're going to experience consequences worse than you have ever imagined, worse than anything you've come across in your history. That's an implicit threat of a nuclear strike for anybody who is going to interfere with Putin's uh, appalling assault on innocent Ukraine. We're going to have to get used to this. And the problem we have got is that leaders in Western countries are completely unready to handle Putin in his latest incarnation. We're going to have to deal with a guy who is going to hopefully strategically and calmly, but nevertheless, use the threat of nuclear war to try to get things he wants. That's going to be not a bug in Russian foreign policy. That's going to be a feature. Moreover, it's going to be the main tool of Russian foreign policy. With Ukraine, what we had is threat of war followed by war. What we're going to have going forward is not just threat of war, it's going to be threat of nuclear war, and we're going to have to learn to handle this. What about the Ukraine? This is difficult. I think that sometimes no words is better than words, because I feel 2% responsible for what's happening. I'm not a citizen of Russia or the Ukraine, but I lived in the 1980s in the Soviet Union, and if you count 19th century literature as a Russian thing, which of course it is so much, then I am to some extent Russian, maybe 25% Russian. And so I feel that this is to some extent being done in my name, and I find it unacceptable. And what I would like to do with Putin isn't, of course, something I can say on a social media platform. The positive note here is that I am 40 years old and I know that many of my viewers are younger. And I think when you guys are old, you're going to see a Russia that does recognize Ukraine as a legitimate sovereign state and does recognize Ukrainians as a sisterly, brotherly people, but a separate people. But for that, we might need at the very least half a century. To understand all of this a bit more and really grasp the dynamics behind the walls of the Kremlin, you've got to watch my long-form video essay about the run-up to the invasion. And if you've seen that, I'm going to recommend another video in the comment section of this one. Российские матери, я нахожусь сейчас в центре Киева, столице суверенной, независимой Украины, на которую сегодня совершено нападение злодейским режимом Путина. Сегодня под боем большинство наших городов. Бомбы падают на наши города. Сейчас в Гастомеле, под Киевом, в аэропорту высадилось 30 российских вертолетов, подбиты три. Идет бой. Ваши дети будут погибать здесь. Не получится иначе. Не мы пришли к вам. Вы пришли к нам. Требуйте от этого злодея остановить войну. 